Hi guys, thanks for coming. It's great to be here. I love inventors. My grandfather said to me one time, he came home from work or something, he had a, a company where he had acquired a lot of tubing after World War II, and he was selling this tubing, and he said, you know, you'll never make any money working for somebody else. What you gotta do is you gotta invent something and sell it, and then you'll live happily ever after. And I thought, that's what I gotta do. So, we said about that, and what I start this, this show out with is it's great you're inventors because, of course, the classic is, what do you do? Invent a better mousetrap, right? So some of you will invent a better mousetrap. Some of you will make better cheese. Some of you will become smarter rats. I'm in the business of making helmets, which is to help. This is typically when I, when I talk about business planning and raising capital. You know, like, this is you, here's the money, and here's the investor, and... I'm going to help you not get, you're going to get the cheese and not get your head smacked with this thing. So that's my silly little thing on that. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado. So what I always love is, you know, I, I gave a, a talk like this several times before and the questions always come up, you know, about, you know, people, I, I would teach these classes on business planning at an organization and we would always ask people, so what do you need next? And they always say, I need money. I need money. I've got to have money. And how many of you are raising money? Anybody need to raise money for your things? Okay, one, two, three. And where's Arthur, Arthur Lipper with his new way of doing it, which I, you have used and appreciate for raising capital and sharing some of your revenue with the investors. It's really a great deal because a lot of these angel investors are getting older and the problem is they're not going to live long enough to get the return on their investments. So they'd like to get some of the return now. And that's maybe not a kind thing to say, but it just seems a little bit of reality and you know, people can appreciate that. Everybody wants their money now. And so some of the questions that came up were, were a lot of these, you know, and it talks about raising money. And I think what really seems to happen is many people can't even get started without some clear runway of, of where to go. And as a pilot, I think of if the runway is too short, you just can't take off. You don't want to get full speed, full power, halfway down the runway and then run out of runway and, you know, you're not take flying yet. So it's part of the problem seems to be is, I've got this invention, I'm gonna, I wanna sell it, how far can I go? And at some point I'm gonna need money, and how am I gonna get the money? And then all these, the fear kicks in like, okay, what, how, much, what, how much should I raise? And you know, how much of my company do I have to give up? And how many, you know, most people don't like to give up any of their company, which comes back to Arthur Lipper's promo program where you don't give up any of your company, you just give them some of the revenue off the top, which is a good deal. How do you maintain control was a, is a favorite. And the key ones really is how do you get an investor to invest in you sooner than later? Because they've got all the time in the world. They don't need to write you a check at all. They can just spend it doing something else. So how do you best position yourself for investors? But the thing I really want to talk about, and when I would ask people, you know, what do you need next? And they say, I need money. I'd say, well, do you have certain things? I'm going to go over that in this presentation. And it occurred to me there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do before you need money, a bunch of stuff you can do when you don't need outside capital at all, and you may be able to just continue your business indefinitely without raising outside money. And there's a number of companies already, that I think a few have gone public already, and they didn't raise any outside capital, so it's, it's doable. But a lot of people are fixated on, I've got to have investors, otherwise this thing's not going to make it. Now, out of the other side of my mouth, I'm going to say, all the things I'm going to tell you to do here are going to be the very things that are going to position you to be ready for the investor. So when I ask the people, what do you need next? I need capital. I say, well, do you have a business plan? Do you have a team? Do you have any letters from customers? Have you done some research? They go, well, no, I need money. And they didn't realize that there was a lot they needed to do before they ever raised any capital. Oh, wait. And then my favorite, of course, talking about explaining your vision. I always imagine Walt Disney. You know, he, when he was pitching Disneyland, he would wave his hands over, like, you know, look out at this, what was it? An orange grove. You had to use your imagination to picture a mountain with a roller coaster in it, a monorail that went around the outside. And by the way, what the hell is a monorail? Back when he was pitching it, right? And you have Frontierland and Tomorrowland and Fantasyland, and all his cartoon characters are going to walk up Main Street with, with lights on an electrical parade. He had to pitch this over 600 times to get about 30 investors. How many of you would be willing to pitch your business 600 times to get 30 investors? Hey, we have a taker. Okay, good. <laughs> Colonel Sanders, he pitched his Colonel T Kentucky Fried Chicken, what, 1,100 times? Of course, he got to eat it along the way, so he didn't starve to death. But anyway, so a little bit about me. What's a nice guy like me doing in a business like this? And I also want to say something about a slide like this or talking about 
the question I always ask people, so what's a nice person like you doing in a business like this? Because some of your story, without getting into all the gory details of your story, are really useful as to why someone would invest in you. Because if there's a why you're doing this thing. It's, um, they, don't invest, they don't buy, your customers don't just buy from you what you sell, they buy why you sell it. Does that make sense? So, I've done different things, you know. Um, uh, the Sharper Image catalog was a lot of fun. I was the electronics buyer. So people would come in and, you know, sell all the electronic stuff. We put it in the catalog and I saw all these inventions and goodies and things, and that was a lot of fun. I sold word processors at one point. The interesting thing about word processors, which is akin to pitching investors, is when you sell a word processor, you go in and you talk to the person who uses the word processor. And you sell them the wonders of how great this thing is and what it does and how it's going to make their life easier and how much more comfortable, how much better looking it is and all that. Then you sell their supervisor how great it's going to be for all our happy people who are going to be more productive, get more work done, be happy campers and all that. And then you go to sell the supervisor's supervisor and why this is going to be a good deal. You go to the CFO or the financial person, and you explain to them why if you could save 15 minutes a day or an hour a day for each of these people at $30,000 a year, how much money it was going to save them, which of course is less than the lease for the equipment, right? Or no, it's way more than the lease for the equipment, what am I saying? So the, the equipment is less expensive than the savings, you know, so it's a good deal, it's going to be worth it. And then if you happen to you know, pitch it to the CEO, they want to know how it's going to be great for their company and all this high level stuff. So there's all these multiple levels. So when you're talking to investors, what happens is they're going to take your idea, they're going to take the mechanical part of it and show it to their mechanical friends. They're going to take your financial aspect of your business and they're going to show it to their financial friends. So they're going to be showing, so you're going to be pitching different aspects of your business and your invention in different ways to if, you're, if you need to raise money for it. And I'm going to talk here in terms of raising capital, even though the title of my whole presentation is How to Build Your Business Without Capital. It's going to be the very thing you'll be ready to raise capital if you need to. And, and again, the thing is, you are the investor yourself. If you're going to spend the time, your money, putting it into this thing, you are a venture capitalist. You are the angel investor. So you should think th about your own business just like an investor would. Okay, then business power tools is what I've evolved to now. Oh, do, the auto exchange was a, uh, I did this in college. I was really frustrated. I was a, a, first an, an engineering major. I switched to business econ at UC Santa Barbara. And I saw this, this guy was running, I just got this idea to, to do this do-it-yourself used car lot. And so my senior year in college, I rented a parking lot from a guy in town in Santa Barbara, and I ran ads in the paper and bring your car down. And the idea was it was like it, you, you would bring your car and park it on my lot. I'd give you a nice big for sale sign where you'd you know, describe the car on it, the price you wanted. And then people would, and I'd run ads on the radio and put them in, in, in on, on uh, I didn't have any TV ads. I did have a TV ad, I don't know. And some newspaper ads, and people would come down and look at the cars. Because it's better than looking at classifieds. You can go see the real thing, and you're buying it from the owner. So it's kind of a cool deal. <laughs> you know, it's one of, those, one of those learning businesses, you know. I borrowed $5,000 from my grandmother. I had no plan whatsoever. I just kind of spent the money, did the things. Halfway into it, I realized I need to make some changes. And I, didn't have, I ran out of money. But I still borrowed some more from her. Good, great having a grandmother. And so the um, thing was, I should have had the lot seven days a week. It was just on Sundays. And after, you know, in college, I was in a fraternity. I'd wake up after some Saturday night party. It'd be Sunday morning, and there'd be me on the radio saying, hey, it's Burke Franklin. Come on down to the auto exchange. Rent a space and sell your car. And I'd just lay there in bed thinking, oh, what have I done? You know, created a monster. So lots of things to learn business-wise. Just got to do a few of them, you know. But the real thing that always got me was whatever happened to all the cool stuff I've seen in popular mechanics and popular science over the years. I saw some great gadgets and gizmos and inventions and things in the magazines, uh, at the Sharper Image, and a lot of them, where'd they go? They vanished. Something went wrong. Something crashed and burned. They didn't raise enough money. They got in a lawsuit. Something happened. They didn't manage the business right. They didn't market it. A lot of engineers, I bet I'm looking at engineers. I'm an engineer. I think of myself as one. Many engineers just don't think much of marketing. Like, hey, this thing should sell itself. It doesn't need no stink in marketing. Worked for a number of companies in Silicon Valley. That's a problem. So it, marketing is definitely needs to be there. But I just saw a lot of things go wrong. And so 
what I did was started out. I had a, a friend of mine who was selling his software to Apple Computer way back when. It was a software program to help them design circuits. So it wasn't he wasn't selling his company to Apple. He was just selling the, the, the apps so Apple Apple could use it to design their systems. And here's where the the the, the uh, word processor sales pitch part came in. I knew that he had a business plan. He had the technical part written, but I wrote the part on how he's going to market it. Because Apple told him, they said, we're willing to invest in your software and buy it from you and use it. We just want to make sure that you are going to be around in the future to support it. Now, personally, way back when, before there was a plethora of programs around, I was paying a guy to write me an accounting program. His wife calls me one day, he dropped dead at his desk. The investment in the program, the code, gone. You know, so it does happen. And so one of the questions we even ask in the business plan and suggest you ask in the business plan or be prepared to answer right, more, is what happens if you get hit by a bus? So the simple answer is we have key person insurance and you're named in it. So one of those things. But nevertheless, that kind of stuff happens. But so, so, you know, he got the deal with Apple, you know, because the different people were looking at the different parts of the program. So we had to satisfy the finance people. Everybody needed to sign off on buying this software from him, knowing that he was going to be around. And so my invention fundamentally is this one, because I had other inventions. I made the seats for a boat, which is really cool, a window idea for an airplane, different things. And then, but this is something I could actually make. I could make this, I could copy it to a disk, I could stick it in an envelope one at a time. I ran classified ads in about 30 different magazines from Success to Inc. to Airlines to other obscure magazines. I ran this little, you know, one inch classified ad that said, you know, business plan on diskette, you know, $69, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and then in the 800 number. And that's about all I could get into a one inch ad. And people would call me at one, at, at one at five in the morning because they're calling from New York first thing in the morning there. And I'd wake up at five and they'd say, yeah, I'm looking at your business plan. Uh, you know, tell me about it. And so here's a, a little note to self. What you think about on something like that is have yourself some kind of script. So what I did, because I would wake up out of a dead sleep and pitch black and turn the light on, you know, and I'd had a, I ultimately had a, a clipboard next to my bed. And, every, and I would stumble through the explanation, and every time I, they said, oh, I get it, I think, what did I just say? And I'd write that down. And so pretty soon I had a nice, clean, tight script, so when they'd call up and said, tell me about your business plan, I would read that through, and they'd say, here's my Visa card number. I'd say, right, write it all down, and I'd go back to sleep. And the day I woke up eight different times, and had all these order forms on the floor. I'm sitting before I got out of the bed. I thought, hmm, I think I'm going to go in the software business. So that's how this started. And it's just evolved. It didn't have financial models to begin with. It was just a text template of what to say, how to say it, how to make this explanation in all levels of explaining your business. Because I was seeing business plans from people, some great ideas, but the plan they showed me was killing them. And it wasn't going to, wasn't going to get the investment. So it's all about building your case. Anyway, I don't want to belabor it this much. So it evolved into a bit my business. It used to be called Geon, but now it's called Business Power Tools. I was, uh, here's another thing. I was, it's been called Geon, J-I-A-N, which means the master of every art as opposed to the jack of all trades and master of none. And a Chinese guy would send me emails saying, hey, I'll give you $30,000 for that web address, geon.com. And I thought, no, I'm using it. It's trademarked. I, I've got, you know, no, I'll give you $50,000. What is it you don't understand? He's, I'll give you $70,000. No, I'll give you 100. I thought, that's the sound of one hand clapping, by the way. I, um, I thought, you know, at some point there's a number here that makes this thing worth rebranding. And it got me, got me thinking. And I actually, so I sold the web address to Gion.com, rebranded the whole business to Business Power Tools. And uh, then my friends start telling me, yeah, I never liked that Gion name anyway. This is much better. Like, yeah. So when you're talking to your friends about the names of your product, be sure you're talking to people who tell you the truth of <laughs> how they feel about it. And so anyway, so it's evolved into many more software titles that we have. I've had the experience of being in stores. We ran ads on airline magazines, you know, and then the airline catalog that was there, the SkyMall catalog, that was, that was good. I've been through it with employees, payrolls, lawyers, investors, banks, all this kind of stuff. Factoring, that's like drugs. Wouldn't you say, Arthur, kind of just a real bad deal? But hey, 
If it gets you the money you need to take advantage of a deal that you can't get otherwise, you know, you sell your soul for a few months, get off that very quickly if you, mu if you have to get on it, but you can get the money you need, but stay out of factoring if you can. Anyway, let's talk about something for you. Okay, so the thing about raising capital, you know, these guys get a zillion plans. They, you know, they are compared themselves, so they've got to get some winners, so they're, they're unwilling to invest in, in bad deals. They've got people who are looking at them and giving them money, and there's all kinds of weird terms and conditions. So when you read these things in the paper about how so-and-so raised a zillion dollars at a zillion dollar valuation and all that, there's a lot of fine print and gotchas in that deal. In angel investors, this is statistically seems to be the fact. Middle-aged men, you know, what can you say? And it's, uh, but you know, they invest locally. They like to get involved. They want to help. So here's smart money. This is where you really got to interview them, these people to be with you. Now, you could get these guys as advisors. They don't have to give you money. You don't have to be pitching for money. But you're always thinking about it down the road. What do I need to be doing here? And so you can line these guys up. It doesn't cost you anything to have them lined up. Okay, so I'm going to talk about things you can do that don't cost you anything. So here's my flagship story about how to get free Learjets. <laughs> and so here's a young guy. He had you know, several of his buddies. They were 26 years old. And they were all Learjet pilots, qualified, rated pilots. They wanted to raise several million dollars so they could buy some airplanes and start a jet charter service. Simple enough, right? So he goes out there, he talks to a number of investors. The investors said, you know, this isn't one of the kind of, this isn't the kind of deal we want to do. Venture capitalists don't do deals like this. And so he calls up and says, you know, I'm using your plan, but the investors aren't biting. What's my problem? I said, well, do you know anybody with a couple of jets you can talk to? Goes, meets a guy who owns two Learjets, shows him the business plan. He says, you know, I think you have your act together much more than these clowns who are renting my planes out now. Why don't I just give my airplanes to you and you manage them? Does that change everything or what? I mean, millions of dollars of airplanes and now the light goes on. It's like, hmm, this guy's got a air couple of airplanes. Well, long story short, you know, now they have access to probably about 50 or 100 airplanes. You imagine you go to a corporation and say, hey, you know that plane you have out there? You're not, if you use it all every day? Well, no. And there's lots of people who don't use their planes every day. And so they manage the planes, they fly them for you, they make you money on it, and when you need it, you're first come, first serve. And so how much money do they need to raise now? Uniforms, maybe? Parking spaces for the airplanes? You know, not a whole lot. So. The big thing here is, can you find somebody who's got the thing that you think you need to get the money to get? Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I just beat this to death a few more times? No. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a little weird yet. I mean, of all things, you know. Anyway, so how do you do that? Um, well, this is some of the basic stuff you just have to think about. You've probably all seen this before, and you think about business planning or business anything, you know. Why am I in this business? What am I doing? What, what need does it fill? You know, how do you reach the customers? Where are they? Where do you get the money to do this? That's just stuff to think about, but we'll get into some of that here. You know, I've woven in, you know, I, I, I'm passionate about the business plan. It's your blueprint, it's your movie script, it's your sheet music. Steven Spielberg is not gonna shoot a film without a script. Smart guy, gonna have a script, <laughs> no matter what. But I just wanna make it a point how useful and how many things you can do with this freaking thing because so many people tell me, I don't want to write a business plan. It's so much work. I don't want to do that, you know. But really, it's really for you to think through this business. There was a telecom up north. I don't know who it was or what all the actual circumstances were. I just remember the, the snippet of it that I remember was they had the whole thing in place, except they couldn't connect the last 100 feet to the house. There was some law that was about that or something they couldn't do. And the whole thing just fell apart because that one little bit, because they just somehow didn't think it all the way through. Sure, things change. Sure, all, everything changes. But you know what? Of course, that's why you do it in software, because you can change it. But the idea is, I use the thing for a brochure over and over again. It's a brochure to pitch your business. It's a brochure to pitch someone to come work with you. It's something to help an advisor understand your business. I've used it with the bank, the SBA, lenders, investors. 
The really cool thing was I showed my summary plan. I was working, so my mom is really critical about everything. She always catches like the, the one thing I didn't do. So I, I, I gave her my summary business plan and I said, okay, can you just read this for sanity purposes? Because, you know, I tell everybody, explain your business to your mom. So I'm explaining my business to my mom. And she's, you know, she's reading it through and she goes, you know, I'll give you $10,000. <laughs> I'm looking for criticism. I got a check. It was awesome. So anyway, um, so a lot of what this will do for you, though, really is it's tuning your brain. And the reticular activating system is the technical term for that part of you. You know when you buy a new car and you haven't seen this car really much and then you buy the new car and all of a sudden you see that car everywhere? Has that happened? You know what I'm talking about? That's your reticular activating system. It's like your little radar in there. And so a lot of this, like in goal setting, I think of, I've all think about, I talk about goal setting because I kind of hated goal setting because it always reminded me of the things I didn't do. And so, but what it really told, taught me was that when I think about the goals and the places I want to go, it helps me recognize it. It's like buying the car so you can see that car everywhere. So when you have the plan, you think this stuff through, which again, it doesn't cost you much to do this. You want to have it in place, you need it for yourself anyway. And so it really helps you understand, like, what are your priorities? What are you going to do? You know, and, you know, and what are you really going to spend your money on? This is where, on my car lot, I didn't really think about what I might need cash for down the road. I didn't think about what I might need to change if I need to pivot. What, what am I going to have the money to do it? You don't want to run yourself into, into kind of a, a road block and then need to pivot and have no money to pivot. You say, I'm in this hole. I need to pivot. The investors are going to get you. They're going to want a lot, a lot of equity in your company or a lot of revenue off the top if, they're going to, if you're going to need the money to do, make some change like that. So there's a lot of different things, I think, around here, things you can trade. You can trade product. I trade product all the time. I traded a copy of my book for a copy of this video, right? So, <laughs> so promotions you can get. But the idea is to think in terms of how can you, this sounds a little woo-woo, but hey, we're in California. Get your abundance thinking. So much of our world, unfortunately, is trapped in scarcity thinking. Like, it's not enough. I'm not going to get any more. Give me that. I'm screw you. You know, this is really looking at what do you have, all the different opportunities where you can find what you need. My own example. Uh, so I send out an email to my customers several years ago because I've got all these Windows apps, I get the business plan and the marketing plan and the employee manual and the sample contracts and the safety plan and a whole bunch of different things. I thought, you know, I need to put them all together on a dashboard online and I need to raise a million bucks to write the, cop, write the code to build this thing. So I sent an email out to my customer base. I said, guys, you've been using this software all this time. Here's what I'm thinking of doing. Of course, I talked to my securities attorney and said, this is just a sticking your toe in the water testing the investment thing. I forget what that's technically called, but it's okay with the SEC if you do it right. Anyway, so I sent this out. 251 people responded and said, you know, 249 said, that's a great idea. Two of them said, what are you thinking? So I thought those were pretty good odds. And so Fran Tarkenton, you know him from football in the 70s, his CFO got the email and she calls me up and says, hey, Burke, you know, we've been looking at you for a while. We kind of considered you as a, as a competitor in a way because we're both selling to entrepreneurs and you know, like that. We've built a system that looks an awful lot like what I think you're trying to raise money to do, but we don't have content like you do. How about you come talk to us and let's do a deal? Long story short, we did that deal. They took my content, built it into their system, and sold it for a while, a couple of years or so. And then, you know, as things go, we reversed the deal, and I licensed their system back so I could put the rest of my content in it. I wanted to modify it and things happen like that. So I've, my deal is I got a copy of the, this system here. And we've been, I've been spending a lot of money uh, investing in programming, you know, different interface, adding content to it and like that. But here's the, you know, oh, and I asked the programmers, um, I got the blessing to you and his permission to use his programmers. It's a contract programming house. I asked the programmers as part of my due diligence, like should I do this deal or is this, you know, what? And I asked them, so if we had a blank sheet of paper and we're talking about this, what would it take to reconstruct the thing you built for Fran? And they said about three years and two and a half million dollars. And I got a deal where I pay him a royalty and another fee, but then I can buy the whole thing out 
and I own all of the right title and interest to the modifications that I make to it. So, you know, good deal for them, good deal for me. And so I didn't have to write this thing from scratch. And I got to tell you, as a software developer, when you start out developing a piece of software from scratch, it is just fraught with all kinds of things that can go wrong with that. If you can start with something that works, fundamentally works and looks good, and you got the guys who built it and know what they're doing, I think it's a much, a much better head start. Again, things you can do without spending a lot of money. So, oh, back to the business plan. So people talk about writing business plans. I don't want it, it's too hard. So it's just not that complicated, especially with software. But I just wanted to say this because the plan is your ticket to do all this stuff. And I put this slide up because I just wanted to show, well, show the product, but you know, this is the old, kind of an old image of it, but you know, you've got these different bits, you know, the executive summary, the market opportunity, the mission and vision, you know, the overview of the company, the management team, the market analysis, the demand and revenue model, you know, all this different stuff, and it comes down to the finance and exit strategy, and your capital requirements. There's just a lot to it. There's really no way around it. I mean, Adrian, you put together this a whole big uh, uh, map for mapping out how to get your gadget off the ground. There's just no way around it. You got to do all the pieces. There are a lot of moving parts, but that's just what it takes. And it's really, you know, what I'm showing here is what I've written it for you. So you just go in and edit this because if you don't like that, you just delete it. And so this is some instructions that'll tell you like, hey, here's what, I'm t here's what you're supposed to do, you know, kind of a thing. So anyway, that's, that's that on, on the software. But, but the idea is, well, we saw Adrian's garage. Everybody's got to have a garage. If you don't have a garage, how do you start a company? Right? <laughs> got to have a garage. Apple had a garage. HP had a garage. Everybody had a garage. I started in a garage. Um, I guess a kitchen table is just as good, isn't it? Back room. Back room, kitchen table, garage, patio, friend's house, whatever. But I think about, you know, there's places you can rent or get cheap. There's all kinds of property or office space or warehouse space that's sitting vacant. What's, you know, was that making the owner or the landlord of that thing any money? No. You know, so what can you do to help them? Uh, you can get help from friends. There's lots of things you can do to get this thing off the ground. Just want to tune your thinking to all the stuff you can do. Now, I know in the internet we've been trained that everything should be free online, which is kind of a problem, but because um, there's a lot of stuff that's really worth paying for, I, I believe. But nevertheless, there's a lot of things you can do in your business where you're going to share some of the, you know, the revenue with your friends. Um, then I think about market research, the thing to do about market research to convince people that you're really onto something because they're really wondering, oh, is there really a need for this thing? The simplest thing in the world to do is get your keywords, see how many keywords show up and you can prove to people like, you know, like maybe I should make a government grant product because there's 300,000 people that look that up. So it's just kind of a quick, cheap and dirty way of getting some market research to prove your concept. Big mistake here is that most inventors, and this I will accuse you of, I've certainly been guilty of it, and I see it a lot, and I hear the complaint about it, is investors want to invest in your company. They don't want to buy your product. I'll just say it a lot, even though I said it here. Um, but what do we do? I got this invention. Oh, you got to buy my invention. Check this out. You're going to love this. And you're making the assumption that the investor is going to see, oh, well, if I'm going to buy it, then everybody, the whole, everybody in the world is going to want it. Not necessarily. They just want to invest in your business. So this whole thing here and the things you're doing as you build your business, which will someday attract investment if and when you need it, is how you're building a case for yourself to make sure you're not going down some crazy path that makes no sense. But, you know, you are the Coke machine. You know, you're building the Coke machine. Sure, you're going to give some people some Cokes, but it's the Coke machine that, that, you're, that you're building and this is your product. Does that make sense? All right. So then how do you reach these people? Well, you know, I was in retail stores. There's a lot of things about retail. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to do your marketing and reach people. People often ask me, well, which one works the best? None of them work the best. Some of them don't work at all. But, um, well, actually, all these work in some way. You know, the trick is, is to use all of them and you balance out which one makes the most sense, and then you make them work together. You've got to be consistent across all of your marketing so the message goes out there is a straight-ahead message on who you are, what you look like, what your brand is, all that kind of stuff. So I don't get into this too much. 
How much time do we have? We have a half hour left. I have a half hour left. Am I just talking really fast? Yeah. If you bring some time back in, we'll, we'll put it to you somewhere. <laughs> I know, I get all excited. <laughs> I'll talk really fast, you know. Okay, I'll slow down. All right, so the, the thing you want to think about with these different people, like if you've got a landlord who wants to rent you their office space, how can you be aligned with their interest in some way? How can you, you know, like I said, give them something they want? The cool thing is these aren't like investors and venture capitalists who see hundreds of business plans, who look at lots of deals. They're just looking at your deal. They just see your deal and think, wow, this, this makes sense. The guy with the Learjets, do you think he read business plans every day? No. He just saw this plan. He had a couple of planes and thought, this guy makes a lot of sense, and there's nobody else in the room. So, you know, you're, you're making this make sense to these people, but you've got to be attuned to what different people can bring to the party. Unless you think you can do this whole business all by yourself, all alone, in a vacuum, without any input or any help. Anybody trying to do that? <laughs> just like, <laughs> it's just painful. I've, I've done it. Sometimes I feel like I'm still doing it. And at the same time, you know, it's just one of those things. So, so now, Pete's Wicked Ale, at one point they were talking about, oh, yeah, we're going to build a brewery. You can just see it. You know, oh, we're going to build a brewery. We're going to do all this stuff. There's all these little micro breweries around. They build a whole brewery. What these guys did, take a CD with a formula on it that plugs into the brewery computer. They sent it to Anheuser-Busch and said, okay, here's my roll of labels. Here's the CD for the formula we want you to use to make our beer. And they ran off like a truckload of beer. I mean, I think they even used Budweiser bottles and put their, they put their, their labels had to be made a certain way so they fit on the roller on the machine, right? So the bottles come through the bottle machine. They get filled up with their beer. Their labels go on into their boxes, onto their truck. Where's the brewery? No brewery. They hired, they used somebody else's brewery. Um, and this is relevant these days so much, but you know what? You can get all kinds of flyers and catalogs done by printers and who print massive other things, and they can print, run your stuff off, and it's much less expensive. Uh, I see people, this is probably obvious, I think you obviously use UPS or FedEx as your trucking company, although today Amazon is buying their own airplanes because they're going to go into competition with FedEx and UPS. I question that, but it makes, must make sense to them because they've got the volume. And obviously lease versus buy. Although I have to say, in analyzing, I've got these spreadsheets because I don't do math in public, so I had to make these spreadsheets to, to analyze stuff, you know. So leasing a car or a vehicle is probably the worst financial thing you can do. Do you agree with that? I mean, I think leasing just, but, you know, hey, cash flow, it, it is what it is. You write it off, it's certain, it has some benefits. But in the, in the long run, I think leasing is not that great a deal. But nevertheless, it can work in some times. Um, factoring, I talked about factoring, I don't even talk about that anymore. So what can you do? There's some other things you can do. So these people said to me, I need money, I got to have money. And well, you know, how about a board of advisors? Do you have advisors? Do you have directors? I've made some letters that invite, you know, make a nice letter to invite someone to be on your board. Board of advisors or board of directors. Big difference is advisors really, you're not, you're hold, you, you hold them harmless from anything. They're just here to advise, just stalking. You know, so you don't, because advisors are not going to want to feel like they, have, they could get sued for something. You want to make sure that's not happening, but you want their advice. And it's people you can call, I think of as some, some uh, adult supervision, <laughs> you know. Uh, directors are really more involved in the financial aspect of your business. Like, should we sell this thing? Should we, you know, raise capital? What should we do? This is a little more fiduciary responsibility. But do you have any letters, any I inquiries or interest from, from customers? Anything going on, I think there was a company that Microsoft acquired for $400 million. And the reason they paid so much money for it wasn't for the product. They could have built that. They paid for the fact that the company had so many relationships, all these different other people that they were hooked into, that if Microsoft could just buy it, write them a check, or well, trade them stock, they could have all of those relationships. That's what they bought with that product. So, you know, again, you can build a working prototype. A patent I have on, on good, well, you guys are all about patents. What I understand from my patent attorney is that you have a patent, a utility, an issued utility patent. It adds about a million dollars in, in pre-money valuation to your company. Used to. What is it now? It's a liability. A patent's a liability? Yes, we'll talk about that later. 
Okay, patents reliability. Uh, scratch all the no. <laughs> Exchange. So we changed the landmarks. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. I'm sitting here with patent people, so we know this, so I'm saying this for the camera. Anyway, so you know, where can you where, how can you get this distributed? How can you do deals? I'm talking to these guys right now, they have a catalog, and they wanted me to pay them thousands of dollars to run an ad. I said, you know, what I can do, if you really think this is going to sell, because you're telling me how great your magazine is and how great your site is, is going to sell my product, all right, I'll give you, I'll share the revenue with you. I'll give you, I'll, I told him 50%. You know, you sell my thing for $100, I'll give you 50. The good news is I'm paying for my advertising after somebody buys my product. I'm not just throwing money in a rat hole hoping someone's going to buy something, and I come out ahead. So they're thinking about it. So there's lots of ways there, you know, do some trades. And so, of course, with software, it's great because it, their cost of goods is virtually nothing. So you can make deals like that. But again, you just tuning your mind for how can, I, how can I be creative with these people to help me get this thing off the ground? The big thing here, you look in real estate, they say, what is it? Location, location, location. Well, management, management, management. So the investors, you know, really the, the question is, is, you know, why your product at all? Why now? And why from you? This is you. So this is the part about where your little bit of your story is good. Like, why are you selling this product? If you've invented a cure for cancer because your mother had cancer, you're more motivated than just the money. So I talk about a kind of a blend between there's missionary and then there's mercenary. And so, you know, the mercenaries are just in it for the money. And I would say that a lot of the dot-com crash had happened where all these, you know, guys back then, I knew a bunch of them, all these broad-eyed, bushy-tailed MBAs, we're going to make a lot of money, and they're in for the money. But the moment anything went sideways, they just pfft, they ran for the hills, rats jumping off a ship. Now you take the missionaries who will go down with that ship because they're so convinced this thing they're doing is going to save the world. That's a good thing. Now, neither of those really work. You have to really kind of blend the best of both, where you've got the missionary who's got a little bit of mercenary in him because he's got to make money with this business. They've got to be smart about it. And the mercenary really would do well to figure out what their mission would be that would give them a little more you know, heart in this business to keep it going because it's going to get rough. It just is. And you know, if it hasn't happened for you yet, it's kind of like motorcycle riders. There's two kinds, ones who've crashed and ones who will. So... Kind of an ugly, ugly commentary, but hey, you know, you ride motorcycles, you probably know that. But it's gonna, just going to get tough, whether it's the people become a problem or something goes wrong, all kinds of stuff just happens. And so you've got to have whatever it is to see this thing through no matter what. And if you've got a good personal story that's motivating to you, like, you know, I'm looking at popular science and these great things, and where'd it go? You know, that rig restaurant I love, where'd it go? Went out of business, why? Ugh. Was that preventable? I think most cases probably so. So anyway, so yeah, all this stuff and advisors, you know, so why you, your team, your background, your, your experience. Now, you could have a business that's, of course, introducing something new in the world that's never, ever been seen or done before. But if you got the people who've done bits and pieces of all of that, of course, you put them together, you say, hey, between all these people, we can make this thing go. That's the pitch you're making. And it's, it's the thing you need for yourself. So you've got to be really ruthless. There's probably a nicer word to use than that. But at some point, you know, really, you, you've got to be ruthless. Because if they're not performing, I'll get into this in another slide here, they'll take you down. And you've got to get rid of them. And you've got to get rid of them sooner than later. And I heard one person say, if it even crosses your mind that you should fire somebody, it's already too late. It's kind of ugly, but, you know, it's just one of those things. So I, I guard against hiring friends. I hired a friend, fired him. He sued me. He lost. Ugly, wasted time and money. Um, <laughs> I don't even go into that. That's another subject. But, yeah, so you've got to be careful. So the question also comes up, so how much money do I need to do whatever I need to do? And this might be, you know, how many credit cards do you need to get to pay for your prototype or pay to get your restaurant open or how, who, how much money do you need to borrow from your dad or your mom to do this thing. I asked a bunch of students one time, I said, so you guys have taken a language class before, right? Can you say, donde esta la biblioteca? Now try this one on for side. 
Daddy, can I have a hundred dollars? <laughs> You'd have to do it in Spanish, but just say, Daddy, can I have a hundred dollars? Oh, that's good. But I had to ask you twice. See, you know, if you think about, you know, remember I said the, the angel investors are middle-aged men, right? We walk into that office, boom, what gets triggered is daddy. If you can't ask daddy for $100, you're going to have a hell of a time asking one of these guys for a million. All right, so there's some feed therapy, get that. Um, but just to say, that could, could trigger a thing. I, I noticed that myself. <laughs> I think of all these things, I can't help it. Okay, so the patent's no longer a million dollars. This is now parentheses around this side of it now. Is that what we're saying? The patents are... Oh, we'll talk about the value, of course. You have to have one of the licenses. Yeah, okay. So they've got to have a patent for licensing. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. So the thing is, is you don't... How do I say this? So you could say, well, I need $10 million to really just do everything I want to do. But then if you do that, the value of your business at this point is at its lowest. So if you raise all this money, you might as well sell the whole thing. So what you want to do is you want to raise the smallest amount of money to achieve some thing that when that's achieved, you know, if this patent really is worth a million dollars, if I spend, how much does the patent cost these days? 50, 100? Five up. Okay, five what? 5,000. 5,000 up. So you could borrow that, put that on a credit card, buy it from grandma, you know, but then you've got this and now you can go out to investors and say, hey, I got my, my thing. I have an issued utility patent. And my new valuation of my business is now an extra million dollars. And so then the next round of funding, you're looking at, you've got a much higher valuation. You raise another chunk of money to take it to the next level, whatever that might be. So you're always kind of, this is these tranches of financing. So your company's getting more valuable. You're raising money, but you're not giving up as much par percentage of your company as you raise capital. Does that make sense? It's, it takes a spreadsheet to really figure that out. But I have one of those. So... Um, and I don't do math in public, that's why I have to have those things. So, but I just, want, yeah, I just, I just wanted to know for myself. You know, I made the business plan for myself in case they came up with something, and that became the invention that I started selling because the boat part was going to cost a lot of money to make, and the airplane part, forget it. You know, so anyway, that's, but that's really the question: of how to think about how much to raise is how little can you raise, but what thing needs to be done that by doing it gives you a higher value gives you a higher valuation for the next raise you guys with me on that one okay so then there's the elevator pitch and so the elevator pitch you really need all the time anywhere if you're selling your product selling your company talking to anybody about joining you you got to be able to say something so i say things something like i think of you know i hate it when a good business fails because people suffer I've got a collection of proprietary business templates that will help you grow your company. Like, oh, well, tell me more about that. We're, you know, and that starts the conversation. Now, the elevator, I've heard people say, I just want to make this clear. The elevator, people say, oh, yeah, you're going 26 floors. How are you going to explain this to the person in 26 floors? And this was in Santa Barbara, and the highest building in Santa Barbara's only got eight stories in it. So I'm thinking, uh, sorry, no, you've got three floors. Think three floors. If you can't get this out in three floors, you know, you're in trouble. So, um, but you've just got to be able to, you know, why you, of course, and with some money, here's what I can do. And the idea of, a, of an elevator pitch really is to just the second step. It's like the idea of a first date is what? Get a second date. You know, it's not, you're not going to get married on the first date. You're just going to get a second date. And that's all you're looking for here is you're looking for a meeting. And they're going to ask you for the summary plan, which is going to explain what it is. I even have a friend in Santa Barbara now. She wants to go out. She's a consultant. She wants to go out and work with these companies to use my, my dashboard. She said, well, I want to understand your business more so I can, I can explain it to people. So I gave her my summary business plan. And it's just, and I have, it, have had it written. It's just handy to, boom, here you go. Go for it. So it's just handy to have this brochure ready to go. Oh, valuation. I had to show a spreadsheet here because it's just too complicated to think about otherwise. But we use four different models. There's a Harvard model. There's a discounted cash flow, a first Chicago, a conventional VC method. We add them all up, and then we average it down over here. And this all takes it out of your financial model, which shows up here somewhere. And it will just help you figure out. You need to know what the deal's worth. Because any time along the way, you know, like the guy was offering me $100,000 for my... For my uh, my web address, 
What's it worth? What's, that, what's something like that worth? This helps you understand. So the invest, you don't show this to the investor, but you just have an idea. So that when they say, well, we'll give you, we'll give you $5 million for 50% of your company, whatever those deals they do on Shark Tank, you know, they just say, I'll give you this. You know, they're not thinking. You be ahead of them, you be thinking. Arthur, is there a better, better valuation method in here? I, I must have missed one. So there must be a Lipper method. There is, but we'll go on and do it later. <laughs> okay, I've got to add the Lipper method to this, okay? So that's just a way of thinking about valuation and explaining it, you know, and mostly, you know, it's just for you. I want you to understand your deal. That's, and in licensing, that's probably where a lot of your patents would go. I think about this. I had a team from Microsoft in my office years and years ago. And at one point, the guy leans across the table and says, we could buy you. And I thought, no, you know, thinking, <laughs> idiot. You know, I said, no, because I was just in retail. I was rocking. I have finally hit success. I'm making money. I was so, so up on myself. This, you know, I told Microsoft, no. And wrong answer, right answer would have been, make me an offer or something like that or say something stupid or something. You know, just make me an offer. I'm all ears, something, something polite, you know, and so ah, I think this was probably before I had the spreadsheet figured out for the business plan. Anyway, so the point of all of this stuff is you're building a case because at the end of the day, the, the, the real question you need to answer if you're raising money is, what's it worth? And you're telling this story all along the way. You're building this case for it. You know, the uh, DEA confiscates drug runners, airplanes, and boats and stuff. You know this. You probably also know that they offer them for sale uh, through government websites at auction. And do you know how much a, a million dollar airplane often sells for? Mm, a, little, a little better than that, but three, four hundred thousand maybe for a million dollar airplane. You know why? No log books. No history on the plane. No documentation. Has the propeller been overhauled? Has it been bent? Has this thing crashed? Has it, has its oil changed? Engine overhaul? You know, nothing. So you're buying a pig and a poke. You have no idea what this thing is. You just, you know. So I think by having your, your documentation dialed in and all that kind of stuff, you can, you're really building a case. So when the investor asks you, so I'm willing to give you, you know, $50,000 or a million dollars. How much of your company do I get? Well, by building this case, you'll have a much better picture for yourself because you've got to be able to stand your ground in these things. You know, you can't, these guys do these deals day in and day out. It's like we buy a car, what, every couple of years, five years maybe? These guys on the car lot, they've been standing there all day, all day for years, doing this day in and day out. And we walk on the lot thinking, I want a deal. They go, well, I've got a deal for you. You know, you're at a horrible disadvantage. So we want to have you be at the, at the most advantage you possibly can because I want your invention to make it. You know, I want it to, to succeed and have you succeed in this business and I have to go back and get a day job somewhere flipping burgers so you can keep your invention alive. It's not that bad, but anyway, I'm being overdramatic. So the question is, so the other fear people have, you know, is how do I, how do I maintain control of my company? So you've all watched a baseball game and, you know, the pitcher's up there Pitching, 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 right? And then batters start hitting. It's not good when the batter hits the ball, not for the pitcher anyway. And so when the batter starts hitting the ball, what happens to the pitcher? He gets relieved. Well, that's a, such a nice word. He gets relieved. So, you know, manager, who does it? The manager walks out there, catcher walks up and says, dude, how you doing? Oh, yeah, you're relieved. Now, let's just say nobody walks out on the mound and nobody relieves the pitcher. Who gets relieved next? The manager does. So, but people talk about, well, okay, I don't want to talk to go to investors and raise capital because they're going to own my company, they're going to own me, they're going to throw me out, they're going to put somebody else in, it's going to go really badly. How do I maintain control of my company? Remember I was talking about being ruthless? The manager's not being a bad guy walking out there and telling the pitcher to, to, to you're done, you know? That's in effect ruthless. Ruthless by definition means without care for the feelings of others. It's like, not personal, but you know, this ain't your day. You gotta go. And so if the CEO doesn't start managing the people to make sure the people do what they're supposed to do, the CEO gets replaced. Plain and simple. See how that works? It's just, if you don't replace your people, you're gonna get replaced. 
I had an investor tell me, Brooke, I should just fire you because you're not firing your people. Like, oh, your people have been around too long. Oh, no. It's just weird. Anyway, fortunately, he was actually an investment banker working for me, but he said, yeah, I'd fire you. I, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> oh, your ego just gets trashed right and left. Anyway, so, um, so you know, again, back to, you know, what do you need next? Are you building your business? What are you doing to build your business? I just think about, you got to line up a lot of stuff. You've got to, you know, you can get a couple of jets. You can, you, you really can, you know. <laughs> God, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so that's really the, the, the gist of this whole thing is what can you do? And, you know, I talk about financing without investors. A lot of people are freaked out by investors. They're hoping to God that you walk, they pray to their God every day, please, send in some entrepreneur or an inventor with a thing that I can invest in that I can make a zillion dollars on. I mean, aren't they? They're not sitting there going, yeah, right, bring it. You know? No, they're like, please, bring me something I can, I can invest. I remember one VC in Silicon Valley said, Burke, show me something I can believe. That's all I want, just show me something I can believe. And so, you know, you're, 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 think about it, you know, um, Oh, and listen, one of the questions I ask people, I've learned this in sales a long time ago, rather than saying, you know, you hear about never ask a yes or no question, always yes, would you like to have lunch on Tuesday or Wednesday? Would you like the red one or the blue one? If I could sell you a pickup truck today, would you buy it? No, you know, I like to say on a scale of one to 10, how close are we? On a scale of one to 10, how do you like this car? Scale of one to 10, what do you think about this investment? And that gives them, well, 10 options to say, well, I'm a five on that. You know, I, I'm about an eight. Okay. What would 10, what would I need to get that to be a 10? So it just gives you a much easier way to ask an important question is to ask people to give you back an answer on a scale of one to 10 or one to five or however you want to call it. But I think it's better than asking yes or no, or the presumptive close, which is, you know, lunch Tuesday or Wednesday. So, the other thing, too, that you never want to say to investors, these three things, you know, oh, yeah, our numbers are conservative. <laughs> no, they're not. If we got 1% of the market, if I could sell 1% of everybody in China my software, I'd, we'd be rich. Well, sure we would. But we're not going to get anywhere near 1%. What 1% really tells someone is that you really haven't done your market research. You haven't looked at how many potential customers you really could get. You haven't thought about, this is for you, whether you're raising capital or otherwise. You've got to think about what realistically, how many people could I realistically sell this invention to? And what would they pay for it? Why would they buy it? And so you're really thinking about this. You're, you're a venture capitalist, whether you like it or not. And so, oh, the other favorite was, I was on this panel. It was in Texas somewhere. I think it was Austin. And we had a panel. It was four VCs and me on this panel. And it was a, it was a bunch of college students pitching, you know, pitching businesses at a business plan competition. And every single one of them said, you know, yeah, we're going to do a million dollars the first year. First year, million dollars, first year. And, you know, I, on the break, I said to the VCs, I said, guys, is it me or does everybody make a million dollars in their first year? <laughs> and they said, they all started laughing. They said, you would be amazed at how many people come into our offices and pitch us and tell us they're going to make a million dollars in their first year. So, Warning, you know, these three things, big warnings, this is, this is you, this is him, don't say this, all right? I don't want to say don't, but this is really the, a, a problem. So, well, that's really the end of my show, but this, I wrote Business Black Belt because it's, well, it's not software, but I just all this stuff I learned along the way building this business, I was starting to tell people about it. And I was really pissing off my friends because it was like, I don't want to listen to you. I don't care. You know? So I just wrote it down. So if you do care and you want to learn something, it's about 100 stories, about 70 stories, I should say. I didn't need to write a business book on every single thing. I mean, how much do I need to say about factoring, about this much? Just watch out. You know? But there's a lot of stories in here and things that just I learned. I took a lot of these you know, awareness and consciousness workshops here in California, which maybe you've done a few of those. You know? How do you apply that to business? I did that. Um, so I brought a few of these if you're interested. My deal in the software that I've been talking about, um, because it's mostly written for you, you're going to edit. I say it's easier to edit than to write from scratch. You're going to delete more than you write. 
but it's got the financial models. I think it'll really give you the credibility. And let's say if you know Robert Heinlein's word, grok, that's like a full-bodied, I get it, you know, kind of a thing. Um, you need to understand your deal. A lot of people don't understand their deal. They don't know the value of their company. You don't know the value of what you're doing. You know, what is it really worth to someone to license it from you? What's it worth to license it now versus next year? They could say, well, I could, I could build it ourselves. We don't need to buy it from you. Yeah, but if you could start selling it today and sell $100 million worth of that stuff by the end of the year, you know, there's an advantage to being able to sell it now versus make it on your own and sell it later. So they make a deal with you. See, but you need to be able to understand this so that you can stand in front of these people with complete, you know, I don't need a black belt to do this, but just like, you just, you're standing like, you know, you're not going to take any, you know, but you're, and you're going to do a deal. I've seen so many people wimp out. You don't want to wimp out. That just sucks. So that's what I think this really helps you do. So thank you very much, Biz Plan Builder businesspowertools.com and my name's Burke thank you for thank you for hanging out and watching <laughs> Is there another one there nope, nope.